Welcome to KOEM Presents, a podcast produced by KOEM News Now and the four states' most watched news team. If you're a weekend warrior who likes to go, 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 don't let pain put the brakes on your pace. When you need help with an injury that keeps you from moving, you want an orthopedic team with a proven track record. Freeman Orthopedics and Sports Medicine is nationally recognized and were recently named a 2018 CareCheck's number one hospital in market and top 10% hospital in state for hip fracture repair. Freeman Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, the experience you need to keep pace with life. Welcome back guys to another episode. We uh, took off last week and you'll notice there's an extra seat here. So <laughs> don't be alarmed. It's gonna be a little bit different of an episode. We want to bring Jordan on, and how are you guys doing? Well, I'm in a love seat with Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> love seat. But yeah, doing pretty good. Pretty good. We were talking, you had a, a late night. You never yeah. know when we record this. This is a, We're recording it later than usual. Um, but yeah, you're up all night. Yeah. We, uh, From the severe we, weather. Yeah, we didn't have a ton of severe weather. But we had a tornado watch until 7 a.m. So it's not like I can be like, all right, you guys are on your own. I'm going to go to bed. Yeah. So I had to man it all night and slept some this morning. And here we are. Here we are. Yeah. Well, uh, I want to thank our sponsors again, Freeman Health System, Derailed Commodity, and Grand Lake Casino. And to just give a heads up, the beginning of this episode and as we go through the episode, we'll be discussing the Joplin tornado. Um, so it can be... A little heavy for some people in this area. So if you don't feel comfortable, we don't hold it against you at all. You know, we appreciate you checking in um, and you can always catch us in the next episode. But um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I was just telling before we started that I was, I think, 16 when the Joplin tornado hit and I was actually living up near Lawrence. Mm -hmm. So I was pretty devoid of what happened. I remember seeing, I mean, it was everywhere, na nationwide news and, you know, I saw it and stuff. Um, but just taking it back to the very beginning of the day. So Sunday, mm -hmm. um, from not a, not a scientific standpoint, was there kind of like a different feeling? Like had that week been weird? Had that weekend been weird? Like just kind of weather wise? Um, you, you could feel it that morning. I can always, it, that atmosphere's got that, that little ring to it. But, you know, I mean, prior to the event, the days heading up to it, uh, it wasn't a huge, severe threat. It just really ramped up 24 hours. Like that Saturday was when you're like, hmm. But yeah, on the day, because um, it was the week before Memorial Day. Mm -hmm. So I was planning on going to the lake Memorial Day. So I was cleaning the boat. So I had it outside and I, I remember just constantly going back inside, checking the latest data. Um, and, but yeah, it was super warm. It was like 87 and it was just real windy and there's not a cloud in the sky. So it, and it was real humid. So it, it had that feeling to it, so. And did the heady pattern kind of, cause I know it shows obviously kind of like what the pattern, like what the systems are gonna do, but did it show something that severe? Um, it, in the pattern, I can't tell how severe an event's oh, okay. going to be. Yeah. I can tell if it's going to be a big event or a small event, but because you can't really predict severe weather until short range before it. Yeah. So, I mean, I can say from two months from now, I'm pretty sure such and such storm system will produce severe weather, but I can't yeah. tell you the magnitude of it. But yeah, that year in that pattern, uh, two cycles before was our two foot blizzard. We had a two foot blizzard here. So I, I marked that system and kind of in my head. I mean, we, we talked about, uh, I can't remember. Did we talk about, yeah, we did talk about Chad Creeley. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I knew we were going to get severe weather and, um, but you, you can never, you can't say, yeah, we're going to have an EF5. That's yeah. Something of that magnitude. Yeah. yeah. And what was your day like? I mean, I this seemed like a normal day or if, if you would allow me, my story kind of starts a month before. Oh. Um, a month before, I had a bad case of mono, and it, my spleen ruptured inside of me. Oh, my gosh. Um, I, my parents were in town, luckily, thank God. Um, I was a bachelor at the time, and so my parents were in town, and was getting ready for work, putting on my socks, bent down, and felt like a water balloon burst inside of my stomach right here. <laughs> and 
I'll say it again, thank God my parents were with me because I put on my socks, went out in the living room, and mom says, you are ghost white, what happened? Um, and come to find out, you know, I was bleeding inside, and so went to Freeman, did some tests, found out that I was bleeding inside, did emergency surgery. And looking back, that's how my future wife was introduced to my parents. Really? Because <laughs> after my spleen, you know, it was just mush. So they took it out of me. Oh, my gosh. After the surgery, I was, in, I was in recovery and on the drugs, of course. And I said, hey, hey Mom, this is the girl I was talking about. <laughs> yeah, I really like her. So that's how my parents uh, met my, my future wife. So that was a month before. And so I was at home, of course, uh, the month prior recovering. Um, Mom and Dad were at home. Uh, taking good care of me. And I've shared this story so many times because I can literally hear my mom's voice in my, in, my, in my mind. Before mom and dad left to go back to Chicago area to their home, mom says, you know, if there's ever a tornado, get into your bathtub. Because I lived on the second story of my apartment. Mm -hmm. There was no storm shelter, no basements. So that was, that was the best thing to do. Yeah. I said, okay, mom. Yeah, I just brushed it off. Okay, mom, all right. So they left, um, and then going to May 22nd, the day that it happened, um, went to church. Um, my girlfriend at the time, she went back to her place in Webb City. We were going to meet up again in the evening to grill. And um, like, like Hetty was saying, it was, just, it was just a warm day. You know, I guess I was preoccupied with physically and mentally getting ready to go back to work tomorrow, that, that Monday. Um, but I was actually uh, hooking up a new DVD player <laughs> and all of a sudden the power just went out, abruptly went out. I thought to myself, you know, gosh, that's weird for it to just abruptly go out. It doesn't, it's never happened in, in that part of the town where I lived. Um, so I opened my apartment door, looked to one side of, of me. And over here, there were people looking that way with their mouths open. So what's going on? So I looked that way, and from as far left to as far right as I could see was just this dark, it looked like a dark cloud at first. And you know, it was, a, it was the train sound when you, when you heard it. But as you looked closer, there were big things, big things just rotating around. Just debris, like yes. just stuff in it. And you could tell they were big. I thought to myself, my God, <laughs> tornado. So my mom, her voice came to my mind. Um, and I tried to actually first get the mattress off my bed, but the mattress was too heavy. So I just went into the bathtub. And a few seconds later, um, the pressure got really bad. My ears were hurting. I could tell, I heard the glass starting to break in my apartment. Um, the walls breathed. Mm -hmm. It's like we're like flexing uh -huh. and stuff. Oh my gosh. And. Uh, I said to myself, it's time. It's time to survive. That's what mode I was in was in survival mode. Um, and so Lance, I, I was laying like this. My left side um, was, was down on the, on, the, on the bathtub. My feet were towards the drain. And I was holding on the ledge of the bathtub with this hand. And I still have a scar right here where I was holding a bathtub because that's where the bathtub broke off. Yeah. But to say that the inside of this tornado was like hell is an understatement. The more time that's gone by since this tornado, I realize that I purposely, subconsciously have put stuff in the back of my mind mm -hmm. because if I do start thinking about the specifics of what I saw, what I felt, what I heard, I kid you not, this is not just an expression I'm sharing with you kid you not, it freezes me. It freezes me. I can't move. That's how scary it was. And so inside the tornado, um, the, the bathtub broke off, you know, from, from the floor. And then I just remember balancing, trying to balance that bathtub in the air. Wow. Um, so you're completely pulled com and you're just holding on with this hand. Just one in your one so hand. So, and I would balance the bathtub with, with the weight of my body. I was much skinnier at the time, um, but even the weight of my body, I was trying to balance the bathtub with the weight of my body. And so when the bath felt the bathtub 
you know, it's just quickly, of course, mm -hmm. but when I felt the bathtub going to the right in the air, I would, of course, go to, you know, shift my weight to the left and vice versa. Um, Can you remember if it was wave one or two? Because with the tornado, so you have, because it rotates you and it won that, that huge, you have the first initial wave, then you get in the middle of the tornado and it calms and then you hit the other side. Very interesting you mentioned that because yes, the first part of the tornado was, it broke stuff, you know, from what I could tell. It, it, was, it was damaging, at least to the apartment that I was in. But then it did get calm, uh, but you could still hear stuff right. going around. And so I knew, I knew that the story ain't over here. Yeah. You know, there's more coming. The second part of the tornado or the whatever, you yeah. know, um, that was what broke the bathtub off from the, from the floor and that's when I went airborne. And so that seemed to be more damaging for my case in a way. Um, I don't remember the second I landed. I don't remember. Yeah. I tried to remember that, but we're talking less than a second because I do remember right after I landed, um, again, you know, you look back and like, my God, how did, you know, I remember this nail was stuck in my hand, but you're in survival mode. Yeah. So you know like, you got to get this garbage. There was drywall on top of me. I was trying to yell for help. So I remember this, this just drywall with this nail going through my hand, and it wasn't completely through, but it was a good way through. And I remember moving the drywall and the nail ripping through my skin. Oh, my gosh. But I couldn't feel anything. Mm -hmm. I think my body was in shock. Plus, come to find out, I broke my right hip. So you know how your body pain manages. Yeah. Um, Maybe I was, I think my body was in shock because I, I still couldn't even feel my, my hip. So um, kind of flash forwarding a little bit. Um, these two guys uh, picked me up, uh, went to Steve Slifka's. Mm -hmm. He used to be a sports director here, went to his apartment. A bunch of people did. And then a nurse at Freeman at the time, she took me in her Jeep um, to, uh, to Freeman. And um, that's where I laid in the hallway for I don't know how, how long. Do you remember like how far you landed from? It, it wasn't too far. I can't give you any distance. So it was in the parking lot yeah. of, of my apartment complex. Um, so it wasn't, I don't even think it was a half a block. Um, but uh, so it wasn't too far. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I remember, you know, at the hospital, they were, they were, transporting patients to different hospitals based on the severity and the location of your injuries. Obviously yeah. people who couldn't handle a transport would be, would be kept at Freeman. And then for me, in a way they told me since you have um, a bone injury and it was a bad break in a bad location, they said there was a very good bone surgeon uh, at uh, Integris Health in Miami. It turned out to be one of the best doctors I've ever had. Um, so we went there and so that's kind of was in the hospital for, for a long, oh, long time, yeah. wasn't it? I couldn't even t for for a long time. It was then, weeks, wasn't it? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and then um, went home. I had to go home from with my folks um, to the Chicago area just to heal mentally and physically. Oh, no doubt. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember when I finally, you know, we had some good friends uh, through Lutheran Church Charities. They they found someone with an RV to take me from Miami to the Chicago area. And when I finally got to my folks' home, that's when survival mode, I was no longer in survival mode. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that, that shield up, so to speak. And that's when I just broke down. That's when I broke down. And I, not only for me, you know, because I, here's the thing. I, I broke down for Joplin in general, oh, yeah. that people had to experience this. Here's the thing. I didn't, you know, there's different psychological things that you can analyze, but I think the thing that comes to my mind right now is I didn't want the Joplin tornado to be part of my life. Something so horrific. Who wants this to be part of their life? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. But it is. You realize that. It is. And it's hurtful. It's unbelievable. But you realize that, you know, it, it, it's made your life stronger. You've learned so many lessons. Oh, no doubt. Because of that, too. And so, on the other side, you're here. Mm -hmm. This is happening. So, like, the span, you know, so it went by for you within minutes or mm -hmm. seconds very quickly, but the whole event was, like, 
what, 20 minutes? From what I read online, it's like 20 minutes. Yeah, it's about so 20 minutes. Somewhere like that. So you're here watching it. I mean, what is it like for you broadcasting this? I mean, what do you say? I mean, what? Um, it, well, it wasn't, that day wasn't just uh, that tornado. Mm -hmm. It was, there was a whole nother aspect to it because you now you gotta take a break at some time when you wanna do that. Let's see. What? That's a good point. Let's, yeah. take, <laughs> let's take a quick break and we'll be right back right after this. At Grand Lake Casino, you get more points, more free play, and better rewards. Play at the casino where friends play. Grand Lake Casino, Highway 10 north of Grove, Oklahoma. Check them out online at grandlakecasino.com. Make your home more comfortable with help from Derailed Commodity. Update your flooring with the area's largest selection of in-stock carpet, luxury vinyl plank, tile, area rugs, and more in many styles, brands, and colors. New furniture always brightens a home. We have a great in-store selection, including sofa sets, recliners, and mattresses. Economy to premium in stock and ready to brighten your home. Shop now at your local Derailed Commodity Flooring and Furniture with stores in Brazelton and Independence, Kansas, and Joplin and Butler, Missouri. Welcome back, guys. We're uh, continuing. Doug was keeping track for us. I, I get all caught up in everything and everything like that. I so I, I got to watch a clock all the time <laughs> when I'm doing yeah. weather. So. Yeah. Um, so you're talking about in, you know, you're broadcasting, but there's other things going on. Well, so I, the tornado started roughly about 530, mm -hmm. but I was here by about two because we had all kinds of severe weather that was blowing across southeastern Kansas. And um, so, I mean, I was constant live coverage through most of that day. And we had just tornado warning after tornado warning after tornado warning. Nothing touched down. It was all radar indicated tornadoes. Mm -hmm. So we were, we were well into the mode at that time. And then, uh, yeah, once we got into the Joplin tornado, I mean, it, it ramped up real quick. And, uh, you know, it, it's crazy. I look back, I'm like, okay, it was 11 years ago. Man, our, our technology has changed so much since then. Yeah. Um, but yeah, during the event, it, it caught me, uh, well, it caught me a little off guard. And I, I mean, it's gonna catch anybody off guard because oh, you, yeah. you know that, not off guard that we didn't, we were having severe weather, just off guard of, oh my, this is actually happening. Mm -hmm. And so you, in your brain, you have to flip a switch and then move. And then, um, you know, it, it, I know we had, we had quite a few people at the station because we always had a group of people that always said, if you see me come in on the weekend, we're, we're in bad shape. And I had written on Facebook before I went in, I said, um, things are ramping up, I'm going to work. And I know like Brandon Spiegel, he saw that, he mm -hmm. would have been in a tornado's path and he came here because he knew I was coming here. Yeah. Oh, wow. And so, you know, we, so we got into the event and it was, uh, it developed so fast. It was the fastest tornado I've ever seen develop. I mean, it went from nothing to a mile wide tornado in about 90 seconds, oh, which is crap. insane. So you got to remember our radar sweeps. I mean, we always say we have live radar. Everybody says that we yeah. have live, you have live data coming in. But by the time you see the picture of when it's sweeping is, you know, four to five minutes. And when it developed in 90 seconds. So I'm looking at one radar scan. And I'm like, that looks interesting. And then you see the next radar scan. You're like, yeah. oh, my. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it just went <clears throat> boom. And and then uh, we, the warnings were off a little um, like on the, the polygons. So mm -hmm. where it was going, so I, I just, I had to watch and watch and I knew it was moving due east. And, uh, but it, it was, it was crazy because our tower camp at 7th and Range Line, I mean, I yeah. immediately swung it around to the west and I could see what you saw. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was, I, I've only gone back and looked at my coverage from that day one time mm -hmm. because it, it's just too hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you can hear my voice steps up an octave when you see the tower cam and then it stays there the rest of the time. Um, but we got information in real fast. I mean, I, I think the, the first information I got was um, like power lines down on the west side. Mm -hmm. 
And then I remember seeing St. John's come in and then it, it was just complete and utter just craziness. And then I, so I'm watching it just march toward us on the tower cam and then, and then I could see debris flying around then the tower cam went out. And then I was like, so even still, I, I see damage coming in, but you still have no idea what's going on out there, like yeah. how bad it is. Um, and I was on the NWS chat, you know, which is, it, it's really become a great tool for us now, storm chasers and um, emergency management on there. But it, it, NWS chat was in its infancy then. Mm -hmm. So we had some information coming in. We just didn't have as much as we would now if that happened. And uh, so, I mean, you know, obviously it went from the west side all the way down 20th, 26th, mm -hmm. and then across the range line. And then a lot of these big tornadoes, they start turning right. Um, and that's usually a sign that they're at their peak stage. And, and it did, it, went, it got to Duquesne and then it leaned right and went across I-44 and then it started weakening. Um, so the problem was is broadcast wise, so I'm doing live coverage. Our weekend meteorologist at the time, he was Brian Davis. So we're just, we're going through this. Dow shows up. So Dow starts coming down and giving me damage reports, fatality reports. You know, it started out, uh, you know, 50 injured, six mm -hmm. dead. And then it just kept going up, but it wasn't, it didn't end there because our severe weather kept going. So we, it's something that most people forgot is we had an EF3 tornado in McDonald County about two hours after the Joplin tornado. Oh my God. So <clears throat> we're doing live coverage with, we would start doing breaks, Dow would do, you know, five minutes of news and then we'd go back mm -hmm. and do 10 minutes of weather and then five minutes of news. And we, um, we didn't go off air until about two in the morning on Monday morning. So it was continuous and I was exhausted and, oh, yeah. and mentally drained. And then I, I remember I, I drove home and I like my whiskey. I, and so I poured probably about four shots in a glass, you know, it was tipping the top there. And I went and sat outside and it was this beautiful night there was no wind it was clear skies you could see the stars and you're just sitting there and you're like what just happened and then i didn't go to sleep because that whole night i had um I remember hey, what's the news in europe bbc or yeah. something yeah. Yeah. yeah so i had um news outlets in england and france and spain said can you do an interview can you do an interview can you do an interview uh, CNN, uh, Fox News. So I, I was on the phone doing interviews all night. And then at daybreak, I got in my car and drove down there. And this is before the National Guard got there. Um, and just went through it. And we still didn't really have cell service back yet because I know a lot of people, if you're here, you would remember. It doesn't matter where you lived. If you lived in Neosho, Carthage, um, you know, Miami, you did not have cell service because after the tornado, so many people were making phone calls, it just kind of shut it down. That's what I heard is that yeah. you couldn't even just get a call no, out. Could not do anything. So I'm going through the path and I remember I got to Main Street and I could look over to the west and I could see St. John's and I was like, where am I? I was so disoriented because I was like, I know you can't see St. John's from Main Street, but there were no trees. So it was just yeah. a straight shot. And you didn't really know where you were because everything was just kind of flattened. It was absolutely crazy. And then obviously you're in the hospital. Um, and then it was just pure madness uh, at the news station for, I mean, it felt like months, but that first week was just a blur. And so you were, like I said, you were in the hospital. When did you get to make, like, when did things, communication stabilize? Because, you know, no one really knows, I guess, where Abby is at this point. Um, 
So I think Slifka, <clears throat> in terms of how the station knew my status, I think Slifka, Steve Slifka, the former sports um, uh, director, he called KOAM, I think. Um, and then my girlfriend, my future wife. Um, what, your future wife now, your wife? Uh, my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, after, you know, I was taken to Freeman, Aaron, um, she was looking for me and you're in, you're in, you're zoned out. I mean, mm -hmm. you're, sh you're in shock too. And so she remembers a JPD officer yelling at her, trying to get her attention. Hey, there's a, there's a power line in front of you. <laughs> Stay away from it. But she tells me, you know, she was just zoned out. And so she, um, she called the station. Um, thank God, Shelly Saparito, um, our, our, one of our secretaries here, she answered the phone told Aaron where I was, and Aaron was new to the area at the time. She didn't know how to get to Miami. Plus, a lot of the roads yeah. were, were... Well, I can't imagine. And you, you also had pretty much half the country coming in yeah. Yeah. to the area. So, yeah. So, she says, you know, by the grace of God, there's like an angel. Um, she followed an ambulance. She just picked an ambulance. I, I don't know where she was in Joplin, but the way she tells the story is she picked an ambulance to follow, and... It went to Miami. <laughs> yeah, it took back roads. It wasn't the one I was in, FYI, but they, she followed an ambulance, took back roads, ended up going to Integris in, in Miami, and that's, uh, that's how she found me. Found you. Were you guys telling, because you said you have like, you know, communication with other storm chasers, were you telling them like, hey, don't come here? Like, were you, at a certain point, there's so many people flooding to find, you know, loved ones or just track the weather. Yeah, you know, I don't know. Is it even a priority at that point? You can't even stop people. You know, it's, yeah. I mean, so many people flooded in, but the majority of them were here to help. I mean, mm -hmm. so, I mean, like when I went down there the next morning, uh, there were still people digging stuff out. Like I had a, so uh, my, my German shepherd, Jack, mm -hmm. he, uh, he, I just put him down two weeks ago. He was a young German Shepherd at that point in time, but um, a, a breeder called me on that Monday morning and said, hey, I know you have a German Shepherd. And I was like, yeah, he's, you know, he's, he's about one, one and a half. And she's like, we need dogs. And she's like, the, the instinctively no. And she's like, can I, can I come get your dog? And I was like, okay. And I didn't see Jack for five days. Wow. And so, when I was down there in that morning, you know, there's just dogs around, people around, everybody just uh, trying to do anything they could. Mm -hmm. And it did, it, it got to kind of a mass hysteria scene where so many people were in just eye gawking, looking at the damage and then other people trying to help. And that's why the National Guard had to come in yeah. and put the perimeter up yeah. to keep everybody out. But it was, um, I don't even remember what you asked me. What was your question? <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> The, um just oh the you know storm uh chasers oh, yeah. and stuff you know people just, they like pretty much just that people coming yeah. in wanting to help some people just looking at the spectacle but like at some point you have to tell them like all right we yeah. have to get organized right you know and i think that's something i always hear about is kind of the resilience like when joplin like they really did like they just had to get organized and like you said survival mode mm -hmm. you just have to figure out what you're going to do like mm -hmm. get a plan and then just you know yeah it was um one of the, I mean, I mean, it's hopefully it's the biggest storm I ever go through mm -hmm. um, in my career. But I was so proud of, because um, I'm not from Joplin, I'm from Kansas City, but I lived here at that time uh, nine years or eight and a half years. I was so proud of the community because it um, just came together. I mean, obviously we had. Um, the Joplin PDs who were shot recently, and the community comes together. Yeah, they bond together, and it was like that after the tornado. It didn't uh, didn't matter if you lived in Webb City or Carl Junction or Neosho or whatever. Everybody helped each other. But um, you know, I I was I was also really proud of how fast. I mean, they got all this cleaned up. I yeah, mean, it, it was at warp speed and but it would i mean just awful event and i, I remember dow and i talking several maybe maybe two or three months after and in our newscast we have 
A block, B block, C mm -hmm. block, so A blocks until, and then you get a commercial. And we were like, uh, I wonder how long it's gonna be before we don't have a Joplin tornado story in the A block. And I think it was over a year. I mean, it was just a huge, huge event. And yeah. And if I can add to that too, I mentioned that there are life lessons um, that I learned um, from this event in particular. And one of them was everyone heals differently. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna explain something. Um, one of the reasons why you know, I needed, I said I needed to go to my parents' home to heal physically and mentally, but I, need, I needed to come back here. Because people in the Chicago area, you know, once they found out my story, you know, and, and this came from their heart. They meant it genuinely. You know, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for everyone in the Joplin area. Um, but they didn't understand fully what I went through. Yeah. So I needed to come back here to be with, and I still refer to them as my brothers and sisters, because we knew exactly what we went through and where we're at right now, what we're going through. And so having said that, you know, when we were still covering stories, um, half a year, a year after the Joplin tornado. So that had been painful for you. Well, yeah. I mean, what did your job look like moving forward because I mean you're in the hospital for a few weeks and you have to come back essentially get back on the saddle yeah um, I um you know you mentioned that you you've only watched your coverage yeah I can't do it really yeah you've only watched it once mm -hmm. um hmm. I uh I couldn't watch video of the tornado mm -hmm. because again I view that thing as evil the definition mm -hmm. of evil um but talking to survivors talking to people who lost their loved ones um that that was such a special time for me because again we got to collaborate together we got to share our feelings and that and that was at least for me it was helpful but to other people you know it was a year out we're still covering tornado stories of different you know aspects you know different topics you know um some people just couldn't take it anymore. Mm -hmm. Some viewers would write in, you know, and, and my feeling was, I get you. I understand. I get where you're coming from. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and we've had discussions, we would have discussions in the newsroom, you know, this particular aspect of this story needs to be told. It's going to be hard for some people, but it needs to be told overall. So Yeah, it has to um, get out there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, as and you're exactly right, because I am essentially, and we, I said this to you both before we, we started, I was very ignorant on this situation because I wasn't, I wasn't living it. But like everything that I've seen, it just flabbergasts me every single time. You know, every, every story you see regardless is like a victory in its own right. You know, just the littlest thing to the biggest thing. Um, and just yeah. blows me away. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. It's. We're still talking about it 11 years later. Um, it, yeah, it's the, it changed, uh, I mean. Change things. For meteorologists, every tornado is measured against the Joplin tornado. So it's like, man, that <laughs> one was a big one, but it wasn't Joplin or, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean, you and I both, we're, we're connected to it for the rest of our lives. Yeah. And it's uh, good came out of it, bad came out of it, yeah. but um, yeah, it, it was just a crazy event and terrible day, and I mean, they, that's I mean that's kind of the point of some of this podcast is <laughs> so people are so weather aware because I uh, I mean the chances of that happening again are very slim, mm -hmm. meaning a, a tornado that size goes through a populated area, but it can happen. And piggybacking on what you just said. One of the first things that I did when, you know, got married, establishing a family, one of the first things I did was when we bought a home, I put in a storm shelter. Now, like you just said, what are the chances of an EF5 happening again? Very slim. But I will always say that once you've been through something like this, you're allowed some quirks. Oh, yeah. Don't let it run your life, but you're allowed some quirks. And it's funny how life goes, you know. Um, God has been good to me. I've healed 
within even the past few years, I used to hate May. I used to hate spring. And I'm not there anymore because I realized um, that I have a story to tell to my two boys. Um, our oldest, Dylan, um, he's in grade school and, and you know, I survived the books. I don't know if you're familiar mm -hmm. with them. One of them was about Joplin Tornado. Yeah. And I didn't tell him to pick it out at the library. He just came home with this book, started reading. Hey, Dad, you were in the tornado, weren't you? And I was like, yeah. And I told him something that Hetty taught me is don't be afraid of the weather. Just have a plan. Yeah. If something should happen, have a plan. So I'm going to teach my boys continuously. Don't be afraid of Mother Nature. Have a plan. Yeah. Well, I mean, I feel like I took, I've learned even, I don't know how long we've been going even now, but uh, I feel like I've learned so much. Um, thank you, Jordan, thank for you, man. coming on. And hopefully you guys, you know, took something out of it. You know, don't necessarily have to have fun on this episode. Like you said, everything, everybody processes stuff differently. We hope that you could take something away. And if maybe you didn't experience this, like myself, you were outside of the area, um, got to share in, in these events in the days. But uh, again, I want to thank our sponsors, Freeman Health System, d -Rail Commodity, Grand Lake Casino. Um, if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, we just thank you so much. If you want to see um, the video format, you can check us out on the KOAM Plus app on Roku and anything that you, you stream your TV on. So we'll talk to you guys later and have a great one. If you're a weekend warrior who likes to go, 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 don't let pain put the brakes on your pace. When you need help with an injury that keeps you from moving, you want an orthopedic team with a proven track record. Freeman Orthopedics and Sports Medicine is nationally recognized and were recently named a 2018 CareCheck's number one hospital in market and top 10% hospital in state for hip fracture repair. Freeman Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, the experience you need to keep pace with life. Thank you for listening to KOAM Presents. For the latest content in local news, weather, and sports, please go to koamnewsnow.com.